Thank you, Dean Nasser, for that very warm welcome. Dean Nasser, distinguished members of the faculty, and, and what a faculty it is. The graduates, family, and friends, otherwise known as the thrilled and the relieved. <laughs> a good morning to you all on a day of celebration and joy for the graduates, certainly. And certainly, you graduates uh, can draw breath easily now. Uh, the stress has departed, but keep chewing the mints because two days of alcohol poisoning will have their effect on the dean if you breathe all over him. <laughs> One alone won't do much harm, but there are 800 of you. Now, my wife Sarah wasn't sure that I should even be saying this. Uh, she observed that not everyone is as delinquent as your generation was. <laughs> is that so? Uh, I see a lot of guilty grins around. <laughs> so today you graduates must rejoice. You are, after all, graduating from one of the world's top schools for advanced international studies. Correction, the top school for... <laughs> the top school with a top flight faculty, the creation of the Kissinger Center for uh, Global Affairs, an um, upcoming move to the new facility, along with the Cary Business School, SAIS will make the Johns Hopkins Center in Washington the colossus of smarts in this town. And being a Hopkins grad myself, and in this context, I find impartiality to be such a filthy word. Now, the last time I uh, attended a SAIS graduation was in 1993, when my brother Firas took his degree, younger brother. And uh, as teenagers, I never thought that he was, or I always thought that he was incapable of being capable. Uh, I'm delighted to report to you that he is now the World Bank's representative in Malaysia. So you see, SAIS, is not just a top school. It's a house of miracles. <laughs> I'm not sure he's going to like that. <laughs> All that grind, the late nights, the very late nights, the panic and the fun, it's all part of life's design phase. Now what lies ahead of you are 60 years of grind, late nights, panic and fun, but this is now implementation. Now, uh, before you wreak havoc on the rest of us as you go about implementing, and in the intimacy of this setting, uh, lean forward and listen. Here are some thought drops from Uncle Zaid. <laughs> Parents, uh, you may want to leave at this point. The executive summary of what follows consists of don't fall in love, gamble, betray, look up, be stubborn, play chess, don't play chess, divide and conquer, otherwise known as the Zaid variation of Machiavelli's The Prince. <laughs> so, to the details. Don't fall in love, or fall in love, but not just quite now. And if you have already, uh, <laughs> you're screwed. <laughs> okay, okay, look, don't break up. Stay together, please. And while creating a family is a blessing, perhaps the greatest blessing, some say, try to delay it as much as you can. Uh, look, you are a highly mobile subcategory of the human species. So use your mobility. Travel extensively if you haven't done so already. Live and work internationally. 
Mobility accelerates the accumulation of experiences, compresses them, especially if the situation uh, in which you find yourself is complex and fluid and emotional. Two, gamble. No, not with your money, but with your life. It sounds odd. Right? <laughs> but not recklessly. Do so intelligently. After all, you should never live your life cheaply or die stupidly. Life should consist of a sequence of well thought out gambles. The more calculated the risks you take, the better for you. Eventually, in all cases though, you must stretch yourself and threaten that dreaded default life, the otherwise mundane existence. In Farid al-Din al-Attar's majestic 12th century Sufi poem, The Conference of the Birds, a group of birds debate, in search, or debate whether in search of a leader, a simog in Persian lore, they should expose themselves to the uncertainties of a long and perilous journey. Eventually, many birds do undertake this and take flight toward a leader promised to them only to find when they arrive exhausted and bedraggled, each bird stands before a mirror. So, master an area or discipline well and then summon the courage to change. Make yourself uncomfortable by moving to something adjacent and new. With that, the lines by which you identify yourself, perceive yourself, will sharpen until you reach your own Seymour. Because life, contrary to what many in this town believe, is not some public, personal, uh, or personal public relations exercise. It is and must be more than that. It should be and ought to be something like a search and rescue operation. Search for that leader that hides within yourself and then rescue others around you who need you. Three, betray. No successful treaty was ever negotiated without betrayal. As a delegate, you begin by pushing your country's original position, which, for the sake of reaching common ground, you abandon progressively. A consensus, put another way, is the sum of a preparedness to travel from the original position to a common and ultimately better long-term human fortification. So too in life, all social progress all social justice, indeed peace and uh, prosperity, comes from an act of betrayal against something not right, often unjust. It depends on the extent to which each of us is also willing to betray what exists in all of us in varying degrees. Our own prejudices, be they our bigotry or racism, our anti-Semitism or Islamophobia, homophobia, and the like. Betray that, and betray whatever exists of a superiority complex that we can all journey together. Four, look up. When negotiating complex documents or provisions, if a diplomat or a negotiator concerned uh, commands a technical understanding of political science or development economics, and uh, so, does so m masterfully because they graduated from SICE. It can be hugely important, but so too is their ability to look up and see who's around them, to read the changing moods and tempo, the group behaviors. In other words, an ability to read the room, the community, the business, the country. Five, be stubborn. Be stubborn and fix yourself to principles, universal principles and rights. And there are no exceptions to this. The law matters. In the end, I have little care for you if you're a bright person. To me, it is meaningless without that second part. Who are you? 
as a person? Are you prepared to defend the rights of all people and sacrifice something of yourself for it? In January 1942, eight out of the 15 Nazis gathered around the table at Bansi and who plotted the murder of millions had PhDs. Clever at some point earlier in their lives, yes, but compassionless too, when it mattered most, frozen to the touch, ultimately weak and wicked human beings. You must care for all others if you want to find happiness in your life. Believe not in the supremacy of color and ideology, but in the supremacy of warmth and the love for all humans. Six, play chess and watch others who play chess well. And I don't mean only the actual game. In life, you can learn so much from others who wield real technique skillfully and effortless, effortlessly. By watching a master diplomat, usually from a small country, practicing their craft in a negotiating room, you will learn from them but only if you're watching carefully, in the same way a curious child watches two adults playing chess. You learn to distinguish cunning from stupid. At times they can seem indistinguishable, and the trick in life is not to muddle the two. Seven, don't play chess. Muhammad al-Amin, the sixth caliph in the Abbasiyya Caliphate, was playing chess in the summer of 813 AD at his palace in Baghdad, and so absorbed was he by the game, he failed to direct the defenses of his palace then under intense attack from a rebel army. In the end, the walls were breached, he was caught, was taken to a room and killed. And I know what you're all thinking, yes, he did win the game. My fear, perhaps my greatest fear, is that on the morning before humanity's last day on Earth, the media headlines will say, markets rally, investors are happy. And our epitaph will be, here lies all of humanity endowed with reason and overwhelmed by foolishness. We simply cannot allow that to happen. Do not be like Muhammad al-Amin. Maintain your peripheral vision and understand what is happening around you. Eight, finally, divide the fear within yourself and conquer it. Fear is the greatest impediment, not just to individual success, but to global security too. And allow me just to expand on this latter point for a few minutes. Never in human history has there been such a cacophony of sound. We are surrounded by it, hourly, bombarded with news stories, social media entries, pundits, experts, politicians, and journalists, all creating sound babble. It swirls before us and in our heads. We've become so disoriented, confused, that I, like so many others, feel like shutting it down but dangerously, dangerously, the noise also screens us from a silence lying behind it. And it's this void I want to expose by, yes, I know it, making some sound. While almost everyone is talking or tapping, one category of very significant people are not when they should be, because in the end, they matter to each other. For years now, I have noticed how heads of state and government who ought to be calling out their peers over gross human rights abuses almost always fail to say anything at all. So many of the leaders viewed by the global human rights community as hostile to a broad rights-based agenda enjoy the silence of their peers. Duterte of the Philippines, for example, has had thousands of people killed extrajudicially and has spewed the most outrageous comments toward women. Who at the head of state or government level has criticized him openly 
and regularly. Orban of Hungary makes racist remarks openly, unashamedly, and is there any head of state or government who has consistently taken him to task from the global south or from the global north for that matter? The same applies to a long list of heads of state and government who are leaving their boot prints all over their people's rights, and often the most vulnerable of them. So why the silence from other leaders? For one, scores of advisors will argue, well, if you attack them, you will only invite attack upon yourself. And don't forget those investment and trade considerations, including arms sales. Not an unreasonable line of argument, you may think, but to me, it's simply excuses on parade, meant to hide the cowardice and weakness of the character of the leader concerned. Either the individual leader is committed to human rights or they're not. It's as basic as that. There is no halfway house. And don't get me started on the scores of weak leaders who will speak up only once they leave office. Again, fear. Now, some heads of state and government may take a traditional view and believe it is simply not their place to speak about the conduct of their counterparts when it comes to matters of domestic concern. From a human rights law perspective, that argument is empty. The rights of everyone matter to everyone. I recently heard the Russian political activist Vladimir uh, Karamurza remark that if leaders can treat their own people brutally, just imagine what they can do to you. And the Russians should know better than most. When Hitler pushed through the Enabling Act in 1933, giving himself dictatorial powers, powers with which he ripped into the communists and his Jewish nationals freely, uh, Stalin would have believed it was not his business to say anything. After all, he was no saint himself. In the early hours of the 30th of June, 1941, however, as the Soviet leader sat in his dacha, virtually paralyzed in the face of Hitler's invading armies, he may have well felt differently. Maybe, just maybe, in ruminating nervously to himself, he anticipated Simon and Garfunkel's most famous song and mumbled, quietly, hello darkness, my old friend. You are some of the smartest people on this earth. Privileged, yes, sharp edges too. Now go and smoothen them out by battling against others with smart edges who mean us all ill. Never lose the energy or self-confidence that brought you here and carried you through. Dispense with fear and nurture and cradle the blue ball that is our planet. You're a size people. You can do anything. Rejoice. Congratulations to all of you.